Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the spotlight on our teen historians. I first want to start off by acknowledging that the Washington State Historical Society is located on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people who have stewarded the land throughout the generations. We pay respect to their elders past and present. So tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about a program that maybe not all of you know about. Um, national History Day is clearly a national program. Um, it's very similar to what you might imagine a science fair would be, except it's focused on creating projects around history. There are five different project categories. You can create a documentary, you can do a performance, write a paper, uh, create an exhibition, and I am totally blanking on the last one, it's website. Sorry about that. And of course, website. Um, it's for age groups, sixth grade through 12th grade, and it's separated into two divisions, junior and senior division. Um, Washington State has been participating in National History Day for years and years. Uh, we host the state contest. There are regional contests with regional coordinators, but it all begins at the classroom level, talking about how students are going to approach history projects through primary and secondary source research, and then establishing research questions and developing a project that's all based around a theme, which is established by the National History Day office. So tonight we're actually going to be talking to our three teen historians and our WSHS award winners about their award-winning project, how it was developed, and how that fit into the theme of the National History Day contest in this last year, 2020. Um, I first want to start off by introducing the student's teacher. Her name is Paula Corris, and I will invite her to give a little bit more background into how she does National History Day at the classroom level. Paula, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Um, thank you for inviting me. So in the classroom, I use uh, History Day with, I have younger students and I have older students, and I start History Day with my younger students, my seventh graders. And it is quite a learning curve. It is, a process where I have to think that this is something that we're building on and I'm not expecting perfection the first year, but every week for one day, we focus on history day and students are gathering resources. They're understanding or learning what a primary or secondary document is. And then they're creating a paper and then website documentary performance or exhibit. So I start with seventh graders and then um, they do the History Day project also as eighth graders. And then in the ninth or 10th grade, 10th grade, especially when I see them again, I invite students to use History Day as a project to complete after the AP exam. And so AP exams happen in early May. And so I let students, if they'd like to, to work on a History Day project through the um, middle of June when school ends. And then for the next year, I don't necessarily have them in class. And so I seek them out and encourage them to keep going with their History Day project. Um, and so that's how I've launched History Day in my junior high and high school realm. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. And the uh, History Day program here in Washington State is now overseen by the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, um, which we're really grateful that they oversee that program. It's so important for being incorporated into our classrooms. But what types of things do you feel like students are able to develop when you work on History Day projects in your classroom? I'm sorry, I missed that one word you said. What type of projects? Is that what you said, Molly? I said, what types of skills are students able to develop by working on these projects in your classroom? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so incredible skills. I actually have seniors in my advisory now, students that I had as freshmen, and one senior is writing about his History Day project from the eighth grade. So the skills are immeasurable, and they're research skills, and um, they are these 
analyzing skills of what is a great source really and where should I be verifying this source which is just perfect for today's world so research how to verify a source how to um, compile a huge amount of information and answer a prompt succinctly with that massive amount of information so those are the skills and some students and these three students definitely will be talking about this. I hope that some students are able to get to the level, the skill level of actually reaching out to live authors and historians and specialists to learn information, which is a great skill for a young person. Absolutely, absolutely. And seeing all of these projects, I've been lucky enough to um, actually got my start at the Washington State Historical Society as the National History Day assistant. So I got to see so many different projects over the years from the classroom to the regional to the state and national level. But some of these students exemplify some of the skills that you know, historians need to utilize all of the time, being able to draw conclusions from looking at primary sources, being able to vet all of those sources, and also creating a thesis, but thinking about it in a way that you're looking at both sides of a potential argument, kind of anticipating what um, some of the criticism for that thesis would be, and then be able to then develop those counter arguments, which I think is really incredible to see at students at the junior high and high school level. Right. It's it's not a book report and it's not a here. Let me tell you a story. It's more of an analysis of, wow, why did that happen or what kind of outcomes did that create or what's the ramification today? So it's 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 not a linear uh, project. It's definitely something that takes kids out of their comfort level, but develops incredible lifelong academic skills. Absolutely. And it's fascinating to know that there are so many sources that are much more available today through online research. But then again, as you said, being able to really suss out which of those sources is credible, what types of repositories you might go to visit to ensure that you're getting the most accurate information. Um, that's what I think is so fascinating, particularly about the students that we're going to hear from tonight and why we were so thrilled to award them the two awards that they won. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about how they approached their project in particular, their research process and all of that. Um, I know that things have changed a little bit in our world lately and you've transitioned to more remote teaching. How has that impacted your thought process related to National History Day projects? Well, it unfortunately, it has made it difficult to teach very beginners, uh, right? In the classroom, it's very hands-on um, and it takes a while to really get this going. And so what I ended up having to do is I, I pushed it into second semester where I hope to get them started second semester. It's more difficult online to meet with students and help them with their projects individually. So we've had to push it back just a wee bit this year. And I've encouraged more high school kids to get engaged in the process because they need less, um, less handholding, I should say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit more prepared for right. what's ahead in terms of researching. Right, right. Yeah, and, and the, the, diff, the excitement for students sometimes is also going to a place in person to see like Grand Coulee Dam or to go to the, the um, research centers, the, uh, you know, the primary document spaces and they actually hold the document in their hand. So that's pretty exciting too. That's a little on hold this year, obviously, but it is, um, it is gonna go, or gonna return again someday soon. <laughs> Yes, yes, there's definitely something to look forward to there. Well, Paula, I wish you immense luck in this academic year. And thank you so much for that introduction into History Day and what it looks like in your classroom. Um, you. Yes, and good luck. And now I would like to invite our three award winners. We have Ivy joining us tonight. Ivy is a Paiute student born and raised in Spokane in her junior year at North Central High School. She is deeply involved in youth advocacy and equity work in the community. She serves as president of the NC Multicultural Club, student liaison to the Spokane School District, 
chair to Spokane's Youth Advisory Council and advises the Lieutenant Governor's Office via their Legislative Youth Council. Through these positions, she is privileged with the opportunity to both represent her culture and continue to learn and educate others about the daily lives of Indigenous peoples in this region. Ivy, welcome, and I am exhausted just hearing about all of that work that you are already doing. Uh, thank you. I tried to be um, inclusive of all aspects. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad that you are. And I would like to invite Alexis. Alexis is a junior at North Central High School who has a passion for the environment, education, and health. She loves spending time with her family, getting outdoors, and being involved in her community through volunteering, clubs, and leadership activities. She is also a member of Sunrise Spokane, Operation Underground Railroad, and a Link Crew leader. Welcome, Alexis. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to start tonight. Thank you for joining us. And then we also have Jacob. Jacob is also a junior at North Central High School with a wide variety of interests in politics, music, and science. After establishing a strong representation in school, he is working to expand his involvement in the community through leadership programs and activities. Jacob is also part of the Seattle Holocaust Center Student Leadership Board, as well as a member of the Superintendent of Spokane Public Schools Advisory Committee. Welcome, Jacob. Super excited to be here. Can't wait to get started about our project. Absolutely, I know. There's been quite the preamble and I'm excited for it as well. Um, as I queue up your project, which is a documentary, would you like to just briefly introduce the documentary as you would if you were at the National History Day contest? Sure. Yeah, so the gist of our project is the Elwha Dam and the process that legislators and activist groups took to get it removed. That happened in 2011, but before that it was a long time and several years of lobbying and planning to get um, taken out effectively and um, in a fair way for all parties involved. I would note, we don't get to introduce our project in competition, though I wish we could, because that provides a really nice context for what you're about to see. Well, here we go. And after we view the documentary, we'll discuss a little bit more. On October 24, 1992, President George Bush signed the Elwha River Ecosystem and Fisheries Restoration Act, which enabled the United States to begin proceedings for the largest dam removal in United States history, directly in the heart of Olympic National Park. More than a decade later, on September 17, 2011, the pioneer removal of the Elwha and Glines Canyon dams on the Elwha River set national precedents for shattering great barriers, both physically and figuratively and fueled an ongoing movement for the revitalization of naturally flowing waterways across the country. Freeing the Elwha, setting the standards for breaking the nation's river barriers. For thousands of years prior, the Elwha had carved deep into the bedrock of the Elwha Valley. During spawning seasons, the river ran red with more than 500,000 Pacific salmon that nourished and sustained the flourishing lowland forest ecosystem around them, as well as the physical, cultural, and spiritual needs of the Clallam people who inhabited the river's banks. European homesteaders arrived in the Elwha Valley in 1861. At the time, Washington's first governor, Isaac Stevens, had endeavored to relocate native peoples for a growing population of Washingtonians. In a series of treaty council negotiations with the Clallam, Tuana, Chemekum, and Skokomish people, Tribal leaders signed treaties resulting in the upheaval of their people onto reservation land. In 1855, Clallam chief James Balch signed agreements that would ultimately relinquish the tribe's former indigenous homelands in the Treaty of Point No Point. The tribe was ordered to move to the newly formed Skokomish Reservation over 20 miles to the south. 
In the eyes of the government and non-native homesteaders who wanted to stake claims to the Clallam land, the tribe had fairly surrendered ownership of their historic grounds. The federal government added the land to the public domain and opened the area for homesteading, although the majority of the Clallam people remained on their tribal homelands until they were ultimately relocated by incoming settlers. Some five miles to the east of the Elwha River mouth on former tribal land, the frontier town of Port Angeles was slowly becoming one of the major economic centers on the Olympic Peninsula. Upon arrival in Port Angeles in 1890, Canadian entrepreneur and hustling businessman Thomas Aldwell saw potential in the blossoming town and the Elwha River nearby. He journaled in 1901 of the Elwha, sublime in its majestic and awe-inspiring scenery, was destined to become a mighty power for good in the hands of ingenious humanity for the present and future generations. Within a 12-year span, he had procured the necessary resources to build the Elwha Dam and its associated reservoir. To expedite his plans, Aldwell founded the Olympic Power and Development Company, claiming that his dam would generate 50,000 kilowatts of electricity compared to a mere 500 produced by the proposed Little River Dam. In 1914, just as Aldwell had written, the Lower Elwha Dam began transmitting electricity for residential lighting and drove up the development of a new pulp mill. The Glines Canyon Dam was completed in 1927. Although the Lower Elwha Dam and the Glines Canyon Dam provided a steady stream of electricity to the peninsula and homes, settlers effectively built over Clallam history for electricity that the reservation would not receive. The dams forever changed the face of the Olympic Peninsula and set Washington at the forefront of the national hydroelectric movement of the time period. The kind of dam on a river is by building the dam and having the dam in place, it changes the river and it usually makes things worse. By altering river temperature, water level, sedimentation loads, the timing, volume, and velocity of flows, and by blocking the migration of species, the dams completely changed the environment in which native flora and fauna developed. The construction of dams led to a decrease in salmon habitats by 90% in under a decade. Aldo had constructed the Elwha Dam without alternative fish passageways, violating the Point No Point Treaty and the Protection of Food Fishes Act of Washington State as well. The act read, any person or persons now owning or maintaining a dam without providing a fishway or a ladder shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and punished by a fine. Due to the ever-industrializing hydropower industry, Leslie Darwin, the Washington State Fish Commissioner at the time, and the Olympic Power and Development Company came up with a compromise to substitute the missing fish passageways with a fish hatchery, although it never came to fruition. The great depletion of salmon runs disrupted the traditional life for the Clallam, as salmon were not only conduits of culture and stories, but served as sustenance for the tribe and played a vital role in trade. Preparations to the Clallam people for the dam's violation made by Washington State were mere compensation as fishing of the already diminished salmon populations was strictly monitored by the state fishery enforcements. Tribal members who fished in the off-seasons were fined and jailed for their violations. After many seasons spent at a deficit, tribes won back more sustainable fishing rights in the United States versus Washington. When the Honorable George Bolton ruled to guarantee 50% of all harvestable fish on Washington rivers back to its tribal populations. In 1973, conservationists came together in Denver, Colorado to discuss the damming of American rivers. In 1991, the fight for removal of the Elwha River's two dams began, legitimizing the case that the dams were now obsolete and unsafe. Increasingly, is that the owner of a dam says, hmm, it's going to, to do all the things I need to do to offset the environmental impacts of this dam. It's actually going to cost me more than the dam is worth in terms of generating electricity. Aldwell had failed to renew the license for the Lower Elwha Dam following a lawsuit from the Kalalam tribe. This interrupted the relicensing process and provided American Rivers with good cause for the dam's removal. With the help of American Rivers organization, environmentalists, and the Clallam people who had been outspoken opponents to the two dams since their construction, scientists and engineers sourced a final push towards the controversial removal. Now the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and local Indian tribes are requesting removal of the dams. Certainly alternative power sources can be found for the pulp mill. Demolition of the dams began in 2011 with the use of a hydraulic hammer gradually draining the reservoir by an average of a foot and a half per day. When state and national legislators saw that it was possible to remove these record-breaking dams, 
many became receptive to other deconstruction projects despite their high price tags, the Elwha project costing $327 million from start to finish, thus breaking the political barrier of large dam removal. The U.S. operates a total of 91,457 dams. Washington is home to 1,166 of these dams and provides a disproportionately high level of hydropower to the entire nation. By 2025, 70% of dams will be at least 50 years old, says reporter Jeremy P. Jacobs. Many of these age dams pose significant risks to their surrounding environment, and their removal is becoming increasingly common. It's been a, an extraordinary transformation to see um, all the vegetation return to those former lake beds, and you see kind of coming out of that, you know, a young forest. The river has regained its luminous teal green color and its channel is stabilizing. And finally, the sediment trap behind the dams has passed. Approximately 30 million tons of sediment was stored above the dams. The mass was twice the size of the Statue of Liberty and larger than a 50-story building. USGS research geologist Amy East predicted that about one half of this sediment would flow downstream in 10 years. But what actually happened was that 20 million tons, so two-thirds of the total amount of sediment actually moved out of the two reservoirs. And it happened in only five years, not ten. Perhaps most importantly are the fish populations. Since the removal of the two dams on the Elwha, salmon populations have surged from a century-long low. Chinook salmon are now returning in droves, which have doubled since their previous 60% population decline in 1984, and biologists who study them are excited about this revived, free-flowing river. To the Clallam, the river return means more than just provisions. Fish mean the return of language and a reminder of their history. Today, the Elwha is one of the country's river success stories. Running for 72 kilometers from the Olympic Mountains to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, what was once lost has now been found again for the Clallam people of the Lower Elwha and all living on the Northern Olympic Peninsula. The Clallam people have a thriving culture that has been revived within the heart of the naturally flowing river. The barriers have been broken both figuratively and literally, allowing for the resurgence of the Clallam tribe enabling Washingtonians to visit a renewed Olympic National Park, and setting the standards for the return of naturally flowing rivers via the removal of dam barriers on a national scale. Well, that was Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, let's just jump right in and I'll go ahead and ask our audience members, please feel free to ask questions or make comments in the chat box there and those questions will be fielded over to us thanks to our program facilitator, Len. So feel free to pose those as we talk a little bit more about the project. So I'm curious, how ultimately did you settle on this particular topic for your History Day project? Um, I know the three of us have been so wonderfully mentored since seventh grade. We've all had lots of success with um, projects in the past and we've all been um, brought up to the state level in numerous different topics and forms. And I think this was um, really a nice comprehensive and applicable topic given our own backgrounds and we'll talk a little bit more about our interests and I'm sure Jacob and Alexis would like to share about their past projects but um, Miss Chorus had this idea like she always does about um, topics things popping into her head and we were happy to learn a little bit more and elaborate and make it ours. And I believe um, in seventh grade we actually got a lesson from Miss Chorus on the Elwha Dam and that was probably the first moment that we learned about the topic. From there, like Ivy said, we really just got together and made it our own. Excellent. Well, I also wanted to point out that National History Day chooses a new theme each year. And I assume that that played a role in picking this particular topic. Do you want to talk about what the theme was and how you kind of saw those things fit together? 
Yeah, so the theme this last year was breaking barriers in history. So with the El Wa Dam, you obviously have the physical barrier being the dam. So that was something that we could pick out. But then we have more on a figurative scale, the, um, excuse me, the cultural barriers with the Clallam people and the environmental barriers given that the salmon were um, prohibited from their farming, excuse me, from their spawning groups. And then we have the more on the ecological barriers of other animals in the environment. And so we were able to pick out what those main barriers were, both physical and cultural and environmental. And those became our three main topics for us to elaborate on throughout our entire documentary. It really seems like the theme runs so deeply with this particular topic. So I love how you're making all of those different connections. It seems to work on so many different levels. So it works really, really well. So what was your approach to actually creating your project? Um, I remember that first night we all sat down at the cafe for about three hours and hashed it out in a notebook. What is this going to look like? Uh, I think by the end of that, each of us had ordered a book on Amazon, given our respective like areas of interest. Um, and from there, it was a pretty lengthy process, but um, super in-depth in each of our own realms. Yeah, to specify on some of those, we went from that planning process, and then from there we had to start digging into research. So we obtained many sources from the internet, as well as um, historical collections like the Washington State Historical Society. I think we also got some from the University of Washington. They seem to have a large collection. And um, from there, we really put it all together so that we could weave in those themes of ecological, cultural, and political. That way we could best address the topic of breaking barriers. We also watched some documentaries and referred back to our books for extra information. I know in my book, we were able to look at pieces of Thomas Aldwell's journal and were able to incorporate his point of view into our project. Yeah, and just to make that super clear, Alexis, um, like she kind of mentioned in her bio, has a really strong interest in uh, environmental studies and this general um, contextual history. And Jacob is um, really interested in politics. So he had that dialed. Um, with the numbers and all of that information. And then I uh, have a passion for indigenous studies. And so we kind of split it up that way where um, we saw some really clear paths that we could take this project in general, given if it were one of us. Um, and I think that's what was so beautiful is we were able to take our passions and that's why there's so much content we were able to cover um, and weave it together at the end. I would also say another part of the or component of the History Day competition is creating an annotated bibliography. Um, for us, that really went well with um, the sources we obtained. And then later on, after we passed the regional competition, we were able to obtain some valuable um, and personal interviews from Jeff Duda, Amy East, and Bob Urban, like we included in our documentary. I feel like we need to have all of you come and do some project management with the State Historical Society. It seems like you're exceptional at just sitting down and kind of creating a big idea and finding a path forward. I'm really impressed with how you were able to, you know, kind of split out the different like content areas, kind of tackle all those different skills together. I'm very, very impressed. Um, Something that I'm kind of curious about, I'm going a little off our uh, script here, but uh, <laughs> I'm curious how you, I assume kind of talked about this initially when you were deciding what your approach was going to be. How did you select a documentary as opposed to any of the other types of projects that you could have picked, like, um, you know, creating a website or doing a performance or anything like that? Why a documentary? Well, both Ivy and I have done documentaries in the past for History Day, so it was helpful having that background. So we were both had experience 
and we had a time limit because we jumped into the project a month before the competition. So we needed something that would be efficient. Um, we felt that the documentary also encompassed the best aspects of the LWAP project itself because it had lots of visuals and we had a lot of information to cover. Yeah, and I know Jacob uh, had done a paper in the past. I had done a, um, oh gosh, what is the word, a performance. I'm kind of blanking it out now because it was a lot for me. Um, <laughs> but, and that took a lot of um, personal understanding and uh, narrative from characters and story. And just like Alexis said for this, it was really uh, dependent on images and dependent on the really physical um, changes that took place. Yes, this seems like a very rich topic specifically for documentary. I think it really turned out nicely for all of those reasons you mentioned. Um, and we call that, you know, starting a month out a, a little bit of a creative constraint. So I think that that is an excellent, excellent decision based on kind of like what, you know, what uh, constraints that you were looking at at the time. So yeah, love not that. too much to memorize there for sure, which was good. <laughs> yeah, you can just get it all in there, you know, everything's there, you just play with it and adjust. Um, so how did you begin your research? How did you really get it, get started and where all did you go? Um, I know you mentioned the Historical Society, University of Washington, but you had so many great interviews. How did you go about like actually reaching out, contacting those people and incorporating all of these things together to create that documentary? I think we all played a combination um, of a role in that. I know Ivy was even trying to get an interview for us with um, a representative from New Jersey that was part of um, one of the committees involved in taking out the dam. So that was a really interesting process because um, one of the ones we included in our documentary with Bob Irvin, he's the CEO of American Rivers today. Um, they played a really large role in the process removing the dam. And so it was really interesting to sit down with him. I can't actually remember how we got a hold of him or where we got his name, but he was probably the best of our three interviews. I know for me, I had looked a lot at the National, at National Geographic to first begin to get an overview of what the process was. And I found a lot of the people from our documentary, previous documentaries we had watched that were mentioned in it, as well as in my book that I had. And then some of our interviewees actually told us names of other people who were involved, and then we were able to look them up and find their contact information. Mm -hmm. As Ms. Corris mentioned, um, bringing it to that next level is becoming the historian instead of using historian's knowledge for your project. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, I think personally, I gained so much just in interpersonal um, skills. Like I'm able to write an email to a representative and get a response and set up a date, you know, and that's something um, that uh, took time for sure to develop. I think there are plenty of adults that also struggle with that. So leveling up to be, being that historian that's not afraid to make the cold call, reach out, ask those questions, I think is a very, very useful skill. So where did you find the most relevant information related to your topic? That's a difficult, difficult question to answer. Um, I think it, when it really came down to it, some of those pieces from our interviews, as well as uh, the primary sources we collected, like the pages from Thomas Aldwell's journal, those were really interesting to look at and um, really dive into some of those powering forces that drove the process and what was going on behind the curtain to get everything done. And we talked a lot about it in our research process, but this topic especially spanned, you know, 30 years and even longer given the context and um, it seems so weird that 1990 was 30 years ago, right? But um, that was something we talked about a lot is how do we break up all of these components and find the most relevant and um, natural 
views for each, I suppose, um, you know, and at the end of the path to getting the dam removed, those people are still there working on uh, ecological impacts and such. Um, so it varied for sure. Was there anything in your research, I love, also I have to say, I love that you said 1990 was 30 years ago. It doesn't seem like it, you have no idea. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm interested to know in the course of your research, was there any material that particularly surprised you? Was there anything that gave you pause or made you go back and rethink kind of your approach to your project? I know with one of my previous topics that I wrote about um, in a History Day paper, I kind of had some background on the tribal dealings with treaty councils and Governor Isaac Stevens that we mentioned. Um, I remember from some of my prior research that he once said if a tribe didn't sign a treaty, he would, or the, the people involved would end up in knee deep blood, which is pretty intimidating when you think about it. And that was just really surprising, even for the time period to know that not everybody had an equal share in um, getting the dam put in, because eventually that had numerous impacts on the way tribes lived and the environment as a whole. Really complex, complicated stories that you're trying to tell looking back. Um, I'm particularly interested in the fact that when we rely on primary sources, oftentimes we're looking for old written material. So that might be newspapers, that treaties, those documents that are written down. But so much of the story is about the indigenous experience and what the impact was there. How were you able to incorporate that side of the story when there are fewer written documents? Yeah, we talked a lot about that. Uh, we followed the colonizer history from the beginning to present day and looked at those implications now. Um, and that is a challenge I think for every historian is indigenous culture is often oral. And so how do we capture that in a respectful way? Um, and we kind of made jokes, you know, like um, the elders over there in lockdown right now underground because of COVID. Um, and so we really had to navigate that. And I think that's something we all, um, I regretted at least not, uh, nothing under our control, but not being able to talk to those um, indigenous peoples and those elders specifically. I totally agree. We'd actually planned a trip to go over there sometime during spring break that totally got canceled when everything shut down. And that was really sad that we didn't get any video clips of our own from the river or with the tribal members. Mm -hmm. I know I had to do some, um, make a lot of calls for translating from um, that indigenous language, Salish specifically. Um, there, we read a lot on the website and um, luckily being relatively geographically close, we have people who are able to provide some of that history for us. Um, whether that be elders or those who have heard the stories. Um, so that was something I think we found to be interesting and really unique about our topic as well. It's, it's definitely a challenge for most historians. Um, and now we're, and this has been in process for a long time, other ways to capture that oral history and just making sure that you're listening and aware of those things. And I super appreciate that that was all part of your research plan. But as so many of us know, when you're creating these projects, things don't always go according to plan. You might have to deal with a global pandemic in the meantime. And clearly that disproportionately impacts certain groups as well, including some of our um, indigenous people that are in Washington state. So. It's, it's unfortunate that you didn't get to do that aspect, but it's, I'm still very impressed with what you were able to gather considering. So what information did you hope to gather or what source were you unable to locate that you wish you had been able to incorporate, which you had just mentioned a little bit about trying to interview those indigenous people that were directly impacted, but were there any others that you weren't able to get a hold of for this project? Mench, um, going back to what we had talked about visiting on the Elwha, so the University of Washington Special Collections Archives 
had more actual physical pieces of Thomas Aldwell's journal that we had really wanted to view because my book only had just a few clippings here and there. And they also had video recordings and other audio pieces and lots of pictures that wouldn't have been on their online website that we wish that we could have been able to see in person. For sure. Um, how cool would it have been to hold the Treaty of Point No Point in your hands? I mean, that gives you a different feel to the history itself. Absolutely. And um, one thing I wanted to mention was that with the whole COVID situation, we weren't able to go to as many um, in-person libraries and collections like Alexis was saying. And so I think that probably um, changed the scope of the information we were, we were able to collect and likely even discouraged us from reaching out more to some of those sources. And then I would also note with that 10 minute time cap, there was so much that got left out, uh, so much research that we did, so much writing that we did as, you know, get after it students. We had pages and pages that um, really took some work to edit down. Was there something in particular you were really sad to see get cut out? Was there something that you wish you could have spent more time on specifically? Um, I know for me, it was, um, I mean, the three of us are all pretty strong headed. So I pulled a few like, no way this is going in. Not that's not going in kind of thing. Um, and that was with the balance with the three topics we had, each of us had those specialties. And so it wasn't like each of us gets three minutes and 30 seconds. It was what creates a cohesive story. Um, and I think with every project, there's that balance. Uh, and we wanted to do our part to include the history, include the modern impacts and um, every single little piece. And of course that's not possible, but we tried hard. Yeah. And that, yeah, that definitely happened Ivy where you, you pulled some of those, but I think we all did. And there was one night in particular, the day before our regional competition where we spent, I think it was nine hours together until 3 a.m. in the morning, um, just going over clips and making sure that everything was exactly how we wanted it um, so that we could put together that perfect story. Yeah, I felt like a computer coder sitting there just dragging and dropping for hours. I think we all knew the layout of iMovie after that. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, iMovie, I'm getting to know iMovie so well myself now in this <laughs> virtual age that we're living in. So I can definitely appreciate that. Um, little bit of a learning curve, but once you get the hang of it, like you say, it's just the dragging and dropping for hours. <laughs> So you, you do a really good job of kind of building this cohesive story, like you mentioned. Um, what's interesting is this is a history day project. So it's rooted in history, providing context, but it seems like you really feel like this topic is relevant today. Can you talk a little bit about the relevance and that the significance of that connection to history in the past? Um, I know Jacob and Alexis have different perspectives on this, but for me, um, a lot of the documentation I was reading included that um, erasure language talking about indigenous people and the Klallam tribe specifically. And so for me, it was really paramount to be including those stories in present day and reminding people that that tribe still exists and uh, is thriving in this new river environment. Um, so I would say that is the major uh, thing that I needed to include in the story. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Molly. Um, darn it, what, what was I gonna say? Interesting. All right, give me a second and I'll, I'll, I'll think of. <laughs> no worries, you think on that. And it looks like we have a ton of questions from our online audience. So I'm gonna pose some of those questions to you while you kind of think on that. Um, people are curious, knowing that you had to cut so much crucial information, um, have you considered making a longer version of the documentary at this point? At this point, probably not, just because there's been some difficulty, um, especially at the end of the first process, 
getting the documentary together with um, communication and transportation difficulties through COVID. Um, I mean, it would be a blast to do that. And there's so much information that we definitely cut out, um, but probably not at this point. I'd be happy to share our research with whoever asked that question, but <laughs> that's about it on my end. Like get ready to get to know iMovie and you can put the rest of it together. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a skill to be able to edit things down and make it really concise and still have that through line. I'm really impressed with your ability to do that. It's something that we struggle with all the time in creating exhibitions or programs. So I, I super appreciate that skill in particular. Um, were there any other skills that you felt like you developed along the way besides that skill that I had just mentioned, and then also kind of doing that um, cold call, like reaching out to people and making the ask, are there any other skills that you found that you developed through this process? I'd say interpersonally, I developed better communication skills with my peers because this was a huge project that we needed to collaborate effectively on and practice social distancing once COVID set in. So that was a big one for me. And notably, you can only have one device when you're creating your yeah. iMovie. And so we were on Alexis's laptop, passing it back and forth, you know, from the vehicles. And I don't know if they would say so, but I feel like I'm a better team player. <laughs> I've made some leaps and bounds. I'd say that's probably true. Family situations and everything else just got in the way this time. Um, but yeah, that was definitely probably the largest hurdle we had to get over um, because like Ivy was saying, iMovie only allows um, for your documentary to be edited on one computer, at least in a fashion where um, you would have all the updates at once without transferring massive amounts of information. I think our documentary by the end, if we wanted the high resolution was gonna be 11 gigabytes, so. Yeah, and then of course stating the obvious, but that critical thinking piece, um, I have found myself to um, be using that every day now, uh, reading a news source or looking at a document and realizing that this is one person's perspective and there is a whole world of other information out there that um, deserves to be included in some right and that's just not possible. And so thinking like a historian, you know, every day in every aspect is um, something that I will not lose for sure. Be still my heart. Um, we, we definitely need more students participating in things like this, using those critical thinking skills and being thoughtful about all of those different types of information and how many viewpoints there really are, not only about historical information or historically, but being able to pull that into our present world. So I super appreciate that. Um, we had a question, do you have any pictures or info on the Norwegian communities in Washington, like in Bellingham? That sounds like a question more for me. Um, what I will say is one great thing about the Washington State Historical Society is that um, we have put many of our collections online. So at least they're all searchable, even if you don't see the images very easily. But if you go to WashingtonHistory.org, you can click the little button at the top that says research and click down to collections and just type in search terms and explore that way. We also have um, folks that are on our collection team that you can reach out to and ask if we have that material in our collection. So that's a really great starting point at least. Um, and then from there you can set up appointments with the museum to actually be able to go in and physically visit. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do that again soon physically visit all of those things. But um, we do have a lot of material from Bellingham in particular. Um, and that kind of brings me back to a question for all of you. I know that you were looking specifically for additional information about um, Port Angeles and you were able to find some images and newspapers. Where were you able to find those and how did you locate them? Um, I think Many uh, participants of History Day would say it always just starts with a Google search. Um, you yeah. throw that term in there and then you go down the rabbit hole, which can take you anywhere. Um, and Alexis mentioned that you have one term and you're reading a book and then all of a sudden there are five different people you need to reach out to because they were all included in this other source. 
I'd have to say I found most of them after looking at the University of Washington Special Collections archives that had a lot of information on the Clallam people and on Port Angeles. I think we also had a lot of great visual sources from um, some of the local newspapers, including, I think it was the Port Angeles Times and um, the Seattle Times as well, although we had to pay a small fee and that seemed to be a hurdle for us as well. <laughs> um, but they had some great material because there was one specific investigative researcher um, that had already done a project on the Elwha Dam, so we were able to re or reach out to her and get some of her information as well. Excellent. I just love finding all of those great sources and the diver diversity of those sources to be able to incorporate them into something like that. Um, we have a question here. What are the principal historical dimensions of your project? That is to say your analysis of what has changed over time that made it possible in the late 20th century to construct the alliance of interest and constituencies that won the removal of the dams. That actually ties right into what I was going to bring up earlier when my brain decided to give out on me. <laughs> the Elwha Dam was actually the second and largest dam removal at the time, and it's still the largest dam removal today. Um, at the end of our documentary, we had a little slide about the Klamath Dams in uh, Northern California on the California-Oregon border, and Recently, I found out that um, some of the local government agencies have stopped that from occurring, which brings up um, another point that although we're making progress, it's still a long journey before we can get all of the dams taken out um, to restore our environment to the way it was before. And not that um, we even proposed dam removal in all situations. That was something we were asked by the judges, actually. Um, what is our ethical standpoint on dam removal? And I think that was also um, really great for us to contextualize our event specifically is what does this look like given all of these research points we've um, collated and how do we present, uh, or I guess choose a position on something that is so controversial given what we know. Definitely very relevant, interesting topics for the time. And based on your documentary, knowing that there are so many dams in Washington state, each one is needing to get analyzed individually, separately, trying to figure out what those impacts are currently, what they have been. Um, but it's really great to know that in this particular circumstance, uh, looking at uh, scientists' projections of what was going to happen after removal, seeing how that's been able to play out, both, I mean, in all of those areas that you mentioned, so environmentally, ecologically, and culturally. Um, and I think Ivy, you had mentioned something when we were talking before about um, the first salmon ceremony and that experience. Do you want to talk a little bit about that to kind of share that um, cultural shift now with the dam removal? Yeah, um, I'm going to think on how to phrase that question here. I think that was probably the most impactful piece for me, um, having those or learning about those cultural stories and what we were researching and experiencing, how that affected um, the lifestyles of entire groups of people. That first salmon ceremony, um, there's a video of it. We watched it. I know I was in tears. It was so beautiful. Um, and to know that there's so much rich history and I think um, divisive history on something that could be, um, I don't want to say simple, but uh, boiled down to um, ethics is really um, complex and interesting. Absolutely. Well, I think on that note, you've answered all of my hard hitting questions here, as well as those of the audience. So any kind of final thoughts on this process of having created this project, um, getting to present it at the state level, um, 
and maybe how you're kind of moving forward with this year virtually and how you're still utilizing those skills in history. I know for myself, this entire History Day process um, in general has been really informative and it's built up some of my complex research and writing skills like Ms. Corris talked about earlier. And I think that's been a really core piece of my development as a student um, and just the way I write in general. Um, I, whenever I think about History Day, I go back to my project in 2016 about George, uh, Colonel George Wright and Spokane Gary. And um, it's super uh, impactful now to me. Um, that has become some, or I've been able to include myself in some local discussions surrounding the Spokane history. Um, it's kind of been taking shape here. A lot of people are becoming more informed on the topic and uh, things are starting to change. And so to be a youth voice that is knowledgeable on such a topic is so uh, impactful to me and I think really valuable for the entire community. So I would just advocate for uh, History Day over and over and over again because it really is creating knowledgeable people. And uh, I think youth have such a unique perspective to some of these topics uh, they can really contribute. I'd have to say mine's a combination of both Ivy's and Jacob's. History Day has been a wonderful experience for me to develop complex research skills and put that into application into my community too. Um, overall, I'd have to say that it is an experience I am really glad to have had and that I hope other students are able to have that too in the future. Well, I'm just so inspired by the work that you all have done in this project. I was lucky enough to get to see an earlier version of your project when we were offering our virtual office hours just to be able to create that connection between the historical society and offer any support that we could for projects. And I was just blown away. So I was delighted when you all applied for our Washington State Historical Society Senior Award and Teen Historian Award um, because your ability to create like you said, that through line, that connection between past and present and all of the different categories and your ability to research and to get the heart of some of those stories is very impressive. So thank you so much um, for just taking time to create that project and then also sharing with us this evening as well, talking not only about your individual journey on creating this documentary, but also what National History Day means to all of you and sharing that personal experience. So. Thank you all for joining us and I wish you all the best of luck this year. These strange times that we're in, I still can't even imagine what virtual high school really looks like, but congratulations to all of you and thank you so much. Thank you, Molly. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate it. Well, and to everyone out there, Thank you for joining us. And I just want to do a really quick plug for our next upcoming program. We will be celebrating Veterans Day next week on Wednesday. We're going to be talking about Dory Miller and the African American experience in the Navy. We're going to be joined by uh, Dr. Regina T. Akers, who is with the Naval History and Heritage Command out in Washington, D.C. She specializes specifically on diverse stories in the Navy. She is someone that you don't want to miss. Talk about Dory Miller and his impact on desegregation of the armed forces. And we'll also be joined by Megan Churchwell, who is the curator at the Puget Sound Navy Museum, who is going to be talking about Dory Miller's brief stint here in Bremerton, and then also how World War II impacted the demographics of the military and specifically the military in Washington state. So please do join us on November 11th here on Facebook for that live stream. And thank you all again for joining us. Um, we, I especially wanna thank the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction for hosting the Washington History Day program. They're doing an incredible job. You can learn more about it at their website. Um, I also wanna make a plug for on our website, washingtonhistory.org, we do have 
again, we had to pivot a little bit into this virtual format, but we offered a showcase of some of the History Day projects that were created with the theme Breaking Barriers in History for this year's project. And you can see various documentaries, websites, read papers, see um, video of performances and read some of those scripts. Those are all available online on our website under History Day program and the showcase. And if you want to join us for additional programs in the future, please visit WashingtonHistory.org. Consider becoming a member, supporting us through donation, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much.